Hello everyone, uh, my name is Rebecca and I'm talking about uh, Go tools and editor, editor support today. So I code in Go every day, but I feel like I'm always just fighting with my editor. It's often difficult to get it to work correctly or to set it up and get all the configurations right. So a lot of times I'll try to you know, jump to the definition of an identifier and I just get some confusing error message that I just don't understand or I'll try to upgrade my editor extensions and then I just get this delightful error message that again, I don't understand. And so in moments like these, I just wanna yell at my computer, go, please stop breaking my editor. So today I'm gonna talk a bit about why it is that your editor always seems to be breaking and then how we're actually gonna fix it. Uh, but first I'll just introduce myself a bit. I'm an engineer on the Go team at Google in New York City, and I've been working on Go tools and editor support for the past few years. So at this point, I've basically tried every single editor that supports Go, and pretty much none of them work as well as I want them to. So when I'm coding, I usually want to be able to see the errors in my program. I want to have auto-completion so that I can type a bit faster. I want to have uh, signature help in case I forget the parameters of the function that I'm calling. I want to be able to jump to the, ident uh, the definition of a variable. I want to be able to see its documentation when I hover over it. And I want to get kind of an outline of my program so that I know what types and functions I've already declared in my code. But as I said, not all editors have uh, this level of support. You know, the top editors for Go are, um, they're like Vim and VS Code and Goland, and these usually have pretty good support out of the box, but other editors like Emacs or Sublime or Atom can be really difficult to configure correctly and to figure out how to even use them. So why is the Go editor experience so flawed? Why is it so complicated? Why does your editor always seem to be breaking or slow or something like that? So the first reason is just that there's a bunch of different editors and different ways to set them up and different features and they all work in a slightly different way. It's really confusing. The next problem that we encounter is that these features can be slow when they work. And if a feature is slow and it's just constantly like slowing you down as you type, it can be annoying enough that you're just gonna turn off that feature. So you don't really benefit from it at all. And sometimes even worse than being slow, these features just don't work. I'm sure many of you have had the experience that you just upgraded your version of Go and all of a sudden your editor is broken. What's going on? So new Go releases often cause these things to happen, cause these breakages. And if there's no maintainer for the feature, it'll just stay broken and you won't have that feature anymore. So this all sounds pretty terrible, but I promise you can fix it. So in my talk, I'm gonna go into the details of each of these problems that I just mentioned. We're gonna kind of understand the problems first, and then we'll talk about the solutions. So our first problem is that there's just too many different editors, too many different features. It's hard to maintain. So to understand why this is the case, we kind of have to understand how do Go editors work today, anyway? So to do that, we'll go through an example of just a basic request happening in your editor. So let's say I'm coding, and I just want to jump to the definition of some variable, and let's say I'm using VS Code, so I'll send my request, VS Code accepts it, and there's a, VS Code has a really nice Go extension that works for you know, all of your Go files, and your, yeah, so the Go extension will try to do this, will handle this request. But VS Code extensions are written in TypeScript, and I don't have to explain to you that analyzing Go code using TypeScript is super annoying. So actually, what VS Code does is it calls out to a different tool that's written in Go. And the Go standard library has a lot of great APIs for analyzing Go code. And so there's a lot of tools that are written in Go that do this work. So in the case that we're talking about, the tool that we'll use is called GoDef. And GoDef is basically just a tool that you could call on the command line. And so you could just type GoDef X and you would have, it would respond with the position of the declaration of this variable. So in this case, GoDef handles that, sends a response, and VS Code opens your file at the position that is specified. So this all seems pretty simple, pretty clear. Um, but actually it becomes a lot more confusing if you think about how many different features VS Code actually has to provide. So every feature is provided by a different Go tool. Every Go tool has its own command line interface, its own input and output format. And 
every tool is maintained by a different person, or by different people, or by no one. And so you may not have realized, but when you install the VS Code extension for Go, you also install 24 different Go tools. Let's just throw in all the different editors there, and you see why I'm saying it's kind of confusing and unmanageable to have all these different features provided by a different Go tool. So really, to solve this problem, what we need to do is to make it easier for editors to provide useful features to users. So that's kind of our first problem that we encountered. Now let's talk about why it is that your tools and features seem to be slow. So this kind of goes back to the example that we just talked about. As you saw with GoDev, most of these tools uh, that editors use all work kind of on the command line, the majority of them do. And that just means that you know you type go to fx and you get the definition. That's just really each tool is basically handling one request per process. So go to will exit once you once it sends its response. So that means that go really can't share any work across requests. They can't really share any work between tools. And that's unfortunate because those tools actually have to do quite a lot of work. So every time you call one of these tools, you have to read your go files. It has to parse your it parse the files, and it has to type check your package and all of its dependencies. So that's fine to do every, on every request if you have a really simple example, but if you have a large project with a deep dependency tree, it means that you are have, like, you're spending multiple seconds on a query like find references. So it's really not sustainable. So that's a pretty simple explanation of why tools can be slow. It's just that they're not, they're not, they're not optimizing as much as they could be. They should, you know, we should really be able to have tools in the cache and have basically a shared infrastructure um, that all these tools can share. And so now we come to our final problem, which is why do Go releases keep breaking editors? So editors break with new Go releases. Um, yeah, so editors break with new Go releases because the tools tend to break with new Go releases. So to understand more about that, we're going to consider an example of a tool that has broken over several Go releases. And the tool that we'll talk about is called Go Code. And Go Code is the tool that provides auto completion for your editor. It comes default with VS Code and basically every editor except for Goland. So if you have auto completion in your editor, you're probably using Go Code. And it's worked really well for many years, and it's pretty amazing for that's pretty amazing for a tool that is being used by probably hundreds of thousands of people. And before I dive in a bit deeper, it's also worth noting that the person who wrote Go code is not somebody who's paid to work on Go tools. It was a member of the community, and so if you uh, go ahead and share your work like that, you have no obligation to continue maintaining it as the Go team keeps breaking it over multiple releases. So in this case, really, the Go team should take responsibility and realize that this is a tool that's really popular and widely used, and the Go team should go in and help support it and maintain it. But of course, in this case, the Go team didn't really realize this, and we didn't really help support and maintain Go code. So what happened is that Go code became a pretty good example of a tool that has broken across multiple Go releases. Um, so yeah, basically what happened is that it worked really well until Go 1.10, but then in Go 1.10, uh, we added a build cache to the Go build command. And that just, was just basically incompatible with the way that Go code worked, and it caused it to break. But fortunately, an engineer on the Go team fixed it, and he basically forked it and totally rewrote it. So, okay, solved the problem. But the experience was really bad for users, because basically you had to notice that your auto-completion was broken when you upgraded your version of Go. You had to go into the... You had to realize that your auto-completion was being powered by Go code, and then you had to go into the Go code issue tracker, figure out that you were supposed to switch to a new version of Go code, and then you had to go and actually make that change in your configurations. So it's a lot of effort, and it's really not sustainable to do every time there's a new Go release. So, but hey, okay, at least we fixed it, right? Of course not. So when Go modules came out in Go 111, modules are the package management system for Go, there was another kind of fundamental change to the way that the Go build command works. And everyone on the Go team really wanted people to try modules, but of course every single tool was broken by the release of modules. And so that means that we on the Go team had to go ahead and fix these tools, and so I actually forked Go code and made it work with modules. 
So this just means that now VS Code Go basically chooses between three different versions of Go code when, depending on your Go version and depending on if you're using modules. So at this rate, we'll probably just have a version of Go code for every version of Go. That'll work great. Um, what a, so <laughs> it's not exactly sustainable. And it's also just not fair to Go engineers or to the people who write tools. You shouldn't have to go digging through the GitHub issue tracker just to realize that your favorite tool is broken again. And if you write a tool, if you put that effort in and you share your work with the community, it shouldn't be just broken in six months or you would have to, you know, you shouldn't have to spend your whole lifetime just maintaining that tool and making it work while the Go team just continues to break it. So what we really need to do is just support these tools and really make them work for everyone. But we still haven't really gotten to the core of the issue, which is like, why? Why was Go code breaking all this time? Like, why is it that every new release kept breaking it? So it kind of intuitively makes sense that if the language changes with a new version, then a tool that has to work on the language would also change. But that also just doesn't, but like Go is pretty stable, right? By the time we hit Go 110, we're not really like making any fundamental changes to Go. So it's really not the language that's changing and that's causing the problems. It's the Go build command that was changing. In both the cases of Go 110 and Go 111, the real change was to the underlying Go build system. So let's remember that tools have to read your files, parse them, and type check them, type, 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 type check your package and all of its dependencies. So that's basically like your tool is acting like the Go build command or like the Go compiler. They have to do a lot of the same work. And pretty much every Go tool is written kind of in the same way with having like this whole like chunk of code that does the reading, parsing, and type checking of all your files. So since tools have to copy the behavior of the Go compiler, it means they kind of sort of built in this logic that comes from the Go build command. And so if the Go build command changes and it, cha it moves where your dependencies live, then your tool also has to make those changes as well. And it has to basically copy what happened in the go build command. So imagine if you're, you are excited about the new version of Go and you update your version, but the person who wrote the tool is either not maintaining it or hasn't you know, wanted to update yet, well then your tool no longer understands your code because you upgraded and you have a totally different, like your dependencies are not even where your tool assumes that they will be. And so if you're even, you know, not even just with Go versions, but if you're using another build system like, de like modules or like DEP, which was the precursor to modules, then your tool just has no idea where to find your dependencies. And it basically forces you to put version-specific logic and build system-specific logic into your tools. So that means you're effectively writing this logic 24 different times to put it in each one of your tools. Say, okay, if I'm on Go version 111, do this, but if you're on, I'm on 112, do this. It's just not a sustainable way to write tools because you're just um, duplicating all this work. So really to solve this issue, we have to basically push that logic out of your tool. All right, so I think we talked enough about problems. Let's start solving them. So I've shown you all these different ways that your editor just doesn't work. We've got to fix it. So how? Well, the first thing we should probably do is stop your tools from breaking every six months. And we basically just need tools that are stable and easy to maintain and that actually continue to work. And secondly, we, the Go team needs to commit to supporting a set of features that will work for all editors. So just a core set of features that Go developers cannot work without. So we'll go in th through these um, two solutions step by step. So first we should handle the problems that we just saw with Go code. And actually the Go team did this in Go 111. So when modules came out, Basically, as I said, all the different Go tools broke, and the Go team was kind of tasked with fixing all these tools, and that was a ton of work, and we decided we should probably not have to do this work again, because that was annoying, and so we decided uh, to come up with a layer but that would act between the tool and the build system or the Go version. So we basically created this API that's called the Go Packages API, and it basically does, solves the problem that we had with duplicating this logic 24 times in our different Go tools. So now it doesn't matter if you are using modules or not, or which build system you're on, your tool should be able to be written the exact same way. So let's see how it works. Imagine that I'm trying to write our tool Go code again, but I'm using this new Go Packages API. So usually the way these tools work is, you know, my user, the user is typing in a file, and I have to figure out which package that file belongs to, right? 
And so normally what I would have done before the Go Packages API is I would have been like, okay, I'm in this directory, so I guess I'm probably in this package. I'm just gonna make that assumption. I think that my dependencies should live here, so I'll just make that guess. Now with the Go Packages API, I can just ask it. I can basically just say, hey, Go Packages, what packages this file belong to? And Go Packages has a way of communicating with the underlying build system, and so it can answer that question. Basically, the Go Packages, um, Go Packages talks to a driver that's kind of system specific, and so it says, okay, so you're using Go 112, and you have modules enabled, so I think that this is where, so I know for sure that your package is actually this, and your dependencies for that package should be these. And so, this way, our tools become build system agnostic because you don't actually have to worry about where everything is located and how to figure everything out. The Packages API does that for you. And so that really makes things a lot more easy to maintain because now, you just instead of writing that few hundred lines of code that I mentioned earlier, you just have to write packages.load and then everything just works out of the box. And also, it saves you from having to make these changes every time there's a new version of Go. Instead of making the change in 20 to four different tools, you make that change in one place, and then you're all set. So our tools become a lot more stable. So that basically solved the problem that we saw with Go code. Now we should probably solve the problems that we saw in general with the confusion of different tools and, how to, and different features and kind of that interplay with the different editors. So how can we make our tools a lot more usable for people? Well, what we really need to do is, and by we I mean the Go team, we should pick a kind of a core set of editor features that the Go team will commit to supporting and maintaining for all editors so that it's just really easy to, you know, every user can use any editor and have their tools just work without a bunch of messing around in configurations. And so how do we manage all these features? How do we even pick this set? It's kind of a big question. Fortunately, somebody already has picked them and has figured this all out. So the language server protocol, or LSP, it was designed to basically create a standard protocol for communicating between editors and language servers. And so a language server is a process that runs separately from the editor, and it basically behaves like one of the Go tools that we saw earlier. The editor sends it questions about it, your code, and the language server responds with the answers. And the difference is that the language server protocol has a core set of features, so instead of having one tool per feature, we have one tool that supports all of the features. And Additionally, the server runs as a daemon, so we can benefit from caching and actually sharing data between, between features and just between requests. So basically, we're going to take this picture and turn it into this one. So we have one single language server for your Go. We are, all the editor has to do is basically say, okay, what language is this file written in? And then it can just direct all requests to that language server. This really levels the playing field for both editors and for language teams because now all we have to do is write one implementation of L LSP and we support all LSP compatible editors and all the editor has to do is support LSP and it'll support all languages. So I think now you can pretty much tell where I'm going with this talk. So for the past few months, my colleagues on the Go team and I have been working on a tool called GoPlease and it's the official Go language server. So our mission is basically to provide great support for Go for all editors. And I think Michael kind of teased this a bit in his talk, so it's not that much of a surprise anymore. But basically, Go Please is built on top of the Go Packages API, which I was mentioning, which means that it will work for all supported Go versions and all build systems. And it's also built on top of LSP, so it has a core set of features, and it'll work with any LSP-compatible editor. And also the Go team is committed to owning it and maintaining it, but we are developing it in collaboration with the larger Go community. So it's really been a Go community-driven project, which has been really great because it's, it's allowed us to get a lot of feedback and to make it better depending on the Go community's needs. And yes, it is pronounced Go please, even though it looks like it says gopples. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but most importantly, it's currently an alpha. So you can try it out for yourself right now it really solves the problems that we've covered in this talk. So you should find that it's easier to use and to install, and that it'll work faster than your previous Go tools because it benefits from a lot of caching. And also, the great thing about it is that it'll work a lot faster in module mode, which I know has been a pain point for a lot of people since Go 111. 
We currently support all of the features that I showed in the beginning of my talk, so, but we are also planning on adding a lot more features and we're constantly adding things. Since it's an alpha, it's kind of moving really quickly, so you'll see a lot of changes as, as we go on. So basically, um, you can find information on how to install it on the GoPlease wiki, and there's also just more information in general on the Golang Tools wiki, if you're interested. So please try GoPlease. <laughs> And file issues, uh, send us feedback, request features, and contribute if you're interested. So, thank you very much. We have time for two questions. So the first question is, how does LSP take care of changing files, specifically in context of Git and changing branches? So uh, right now, actually, GoPlease doesn't. You have to reload your window if you change branches um, with GoPlease. But uh, in general, there's like the LSP uh, spec provides like certain functions for us to um, watch files and basically get notified if a file is changed on disk. And so that's kind of a feature request actually that we have, which is to add support for that. And so right now, GoPlease actually is, it really is an alpha. It's not like super ready for, you, for like use and you know, you can't assume that it won't break, but it is working pretty well. But basically we still have a lot of outstanding feature requests that we're working on. So, uh, what is your favorite editor? <laughs> so, obviously, I can't say what my favorite editor is because that's like, you know, playing favorites too much. But I will say that I typically use VS Code for debugging because, um, so the language server protocol was created by Microsoft actually, and VS Code is a Microsoft product. And so, it's kind of the source of truth for, you know, the LSP spec may say one thing, but if the way it actually works in VS Code is really the way that we have to implement it. So, I think the majority of the development for GoPlease is kind of happening in, um, in VS Code. But one of the coolest things is that people are getting like really excited about it in other editors too. And so we have um, one like person who's really interested in Go tools, uh, Paul Jolly. He actually created a Vim uh, plugin called Go Vim. And it's like a whole new thing, different from Vim Go. Um, but it's, it's written in Go. And so like he's using GoPlease with, with his project. And so it's like really exciting to see all the different editors sort of adopting LSP really quickly. Vimgo also actually supports Go, um, GoPlease, so you could use it with either one. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I get go. I'm not sure if it's go analysis a tool because I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm done. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So just just answer that. All right. So thank you, everybody.